not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself since he says, Where I am going you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he was being that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. And He was saying these things, as He was saying these things, many believed in Him. And let's back up now and, and take a look at overall this passage of text. And uh, it's a very, it's known somewhat as the I Am passage, I Am passage, because within it there are six different I Am statements. Um, Jesus is making more declaration about who He is in this passage of text than really you find in any other section of Scripture that we would pull out. So he shares much about who he is. So let's look at those six I am statements, uh, starting first in verse 12. So if you look at verse 12, what does Jesus say there in verse 12 about himself? I am the light of the world. So that's the first one that we see. Now, I want to put you in the context of why he would say, I am the light of the world. If you go back to chapter 7, this is why I wanted to go back there. In chapter 7, he had come to Jerusalem because it was the Feast of the Booths um, or uh, Feast of Tabernacles, whichever one you want to call it. It's the same, same thing. It was a week-long celebration. And in that time, in the courtyard, they called it the Court of Women. It was the place that women could go and worship, but they couldn't go beyond that in the temple. If you remember, the temple was divided into different sections. And in the court of women, there were actually these torches that they would light. They also had a rock that they would pour water on. What they were doing is remembering back to the Old Testament times when they left Egypt, the Israelites did, and when God supplied water for them in the wilderness, when Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, but he struck the rock, water come out. They're remembering that moment in time. So they would pour water every day. They would pour water on this rock as a remembrance, and then they would light these torches. And these torches were so big that it would light up, Jer not all of Jerusalem, but it would light up a large portion of Jerusalem. So Jesus is looking around in His surroundings, and He says, as He looks at these torches, I am the light of the world. So the statement is a reference to where He was standing and what they were seeing and experiencing at that moment in time. So that's why this I am the light of the world statement comes up, although we know He is the light of the world as well. All right, verse 16. What does He say about Himself in verse 16? Not alone. He's not alone. I'm not alone. Um, he's not here doing this of Himself and only Himself, but God was with Him. And then verse 18, 
What do we find there about him? I'm the one that bears witness about myself. And then if you want to add on there, the Father also bears witness about him. And then verse 23. I am from above. And then a second statement from verse 23. I'm not of this world. So I'm from above, and then I'm not of the world. And then uh, from verse 24 and verse 28, what does he say? I am he. I am he. And what he means by that is I am the Christ, or the, you might say the Son of Man, but I am he. In other words, if they don't get who he is from this passage of text, they're probably not going to get it. Like this is enough information for them. And he's already really given them enough by the signs that he did that they should have known this was the Christ. But, but nevertheless, he makes all these statements, and if they don't get it from this, then they're not going to get it, which will then lead us to a discussion we'll have in just a moment. So look at question two then. Going back to chapter 7, which was, as we mentioned, Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, Jesus presents Himself as the light of the world. Why did He choose to use this illustration and example? I've already talked about that. The torches that were all around in the court of women were so bright that it was an illustration that they could actually see, and Him saying, look, you think this is bright? I'm actually the light of the world. I'm, I'm not just lighting up this temple, I'm lighting up the whole world. And so, uh, so that's how he presented himself there. Uh, what reminder would this have been concerning the wandering in the wilderness? So we said in the temple during this Feast of Booths they would pour water on a rock. And it reminded them of when God supplied water for them there in uh, the wilderness. So what would this light of the world, what would that have been a reminder of about their time of wandering in the wilderness? Pillar of fire at night. Pillar of fire at night. He was the light that led them by night. Now, he is translating that and saying, I'm the light of the world, not just a light that leads you in darkness, but I'm the light of the whole world here. But, but it would have been a reminder to them of what their ancestors would have used to guide them throughout their journey. So it's interesting how Christ, when He makes these statements to these people that should be very well versed, in putting these connections together. like It's harder for us because we didn't live through that. We don't have Jewish ancestors that are telling us this is what our, you know, our ancestors lived through. This is what they watched. This is what they followed. You know, this is the Feast of Booths. We, we don't have that, right? We have to study it to find it. We don't have necessarily our parents telling us this is what all of this means and this is what our, our ancestors went through. But they did. And they had scribes and Pharisees that were teachers of this. And they were held accountable to actually knowing, should have been held accountable to actually knowing this and being able to translate this then to the people. And yet they themselves are not getting this. Like Christ is saying, I'm the light of the world. In their mind, they should have thought back, you know, our people were led by light in the middle of darkness. We live in a world that's dark. If He's the light of the world, He is the one that is actually sent to lead us. And yet the scribes and Pharisees, the one that should have caught it, did not get it. Except we find the one, which was Nicodemus, who was going through the process of getting it. Maybe he didn't have it quite yet, but he was getting there. Or we think he was anyway. Go all the way back to Genesis, when God created and created the light. Right. Right. All right, uh, question three then. What was light a symbol of in the Bible? And we've got several different references there. If we want to flip to some of them, we can. Uh, just off the top of your head, though, what was, uh, what was light a symbol of in the Bible? Goodness, is that what someone said? Okay. Hope. Okay. What else? 
Light of salvation, okay. If you had to sum that up with one individual or one word, what would you say? Light was a symbol of what? Of God. So in Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, it says the, this is David speaking, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And then in Psalm 36, verse 9, it says, uh, Then my soul, I'm sorry, that's 35, 36. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light. And again, he's speaking of God. You flip over to some New Testament references in Acts chapter 9, verse 3. Chapter 9, verse 3 says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. You know who we're talking about here? Paul, or Saul at that time. He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. So in, in all references that we see, whenever God is being referenced, it's not always this way, but, but it is a symbol of light in darkness. And Christ is now saying, I am the light of the world. Um, in other places he would say, no one comes to the Father except through me. So, um, so we find that same symbol carrying on. Uh, did Jesus say that he was one of many lights? He's the light, right? Uh, which then would put to rest this line of teaching or thought that you find, and I think I've mentioned this before, you may have seen it on a bumper sticker, I've seen it a couple of times here in Pocahontas, Jonesboro you saw it more, a bumper sticker that would say coexist. And it was a, the word was actually, each letter was made up of a different religious symbol. So you had the, the half moon, which is the Islamic symbol, was the sea. Uh, then you'd have to go through all the rest of them. I don't have them all memorized. But, but anyway, it was every different religion. And what it was basically the, the meaning behind that was all are pointing to the same place, which is not true. Um, and Christ himself here is saying that. He says, I am the light of the world. There is no other light. There are no other lights. I am the light of the world. And uh, so... He wasn't one of many lights. He wasn't even uh, one of few lights. He was the light. Uh, question four then. The law stated that two witnesses were needed in order for a testimony to be valid. Did Jesus deny or defy this law? And did he have a witness? So they're bringing up that he's making all these statements about himself, but he doesn't in their eyes, he doesn't have a witness. Did he deny that that law was valid? Now, what does he actually say? He says, He's God. He, he, he has the two witnesses. He bared witness to himself, and God bared witness of him. Yeah. Do we find that play out in Scripture anywhere that we can see? Or read about, I guess we would read it now, but that they saw and was wrote about. His baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It was the voice of God. You also saw uh, the third witness, which would have been uh, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon him. Uh, what about any other moments in time that we see it that's written about? There's Uh, you could say, I didn't think about this one, you could say that John the Baptist was, was a witness when he leaped in his mother's womb. When uh, Mary came in, in the presence of Elizabeth, you could say that. Um, you could also say that John the Baptist was a witness too, because John says he is the Christ. You know, If you remember going back to, what was it, chapter 2, I think. Um, he must increase, I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. What about other representations of God himself 
I hate to say promoting Christ, that's not what he done. But but speaking to this is Christ. Okay. Okay. There was an event that only the inner circle got to see. And inner circle being you know who I'm talking about? And Peter, James, and John. Yep. Well, so Peter, James, and John was the inner circle of the apostles. So when you look at the apostles, he had the twelve. But then he had three that really were blessed to be able to see things that even the other 12 didn't get to. And this event was one of them. Do you remember what it was? Ascended? When he ascended? Yeah, all of them were there when he ascended. It was on a mountain. Mount Transfiguration. If you remember who came that Peter, James, and John saw. And Elijah, and what appeared to be a third, which was God. And uh, at that time, do you remember what the three said? Let us build an altar to these. And so you find that representation happening then. Now, granted, only those three individuals saw it, but at the same time, they could testify to it. Now, that that had not. I don't think timeline wise that had happened yet. It was after this, but when we're looking at it and looking back, we can say, okay, this was a moment in time where there was the testimony. Now, the one where he was baptized had already happened, so that one was there. John the Baptist had already testified about him as well. But Christ here is making reference to God himself bears witness of him also. And he says that. Uh, in a way because he's saying what I speak is what the Father tells me to speak, which then means it's not my words, it's God's words. So I'm speaking God's words, but I'm also telling you who I am. Now that would have been hard for them to to grasp and, and understand. So he didn't deny it, did he defy it, the law, in any way? He makes the statement, I and the Father are one, not here, but I and the Father are one. Here he says, the Father bears witness about me, so do I. He's not defying the law. He's actually fulfilling what the law says, that there should be two witnesses. And then you also have these other instances we just talked about that were, um, that would have been, uh, what would you say, background uh, support maybe? And uh, Christ is saying, though, that, that he and God are the two witnesses here. Um, today, <clears throat> if we had to define two witnesses in our life today that are from God that would testify to... Um, God and Jesus being true, what two witnesses would we use? And it's not people, so I'm just to kind of... The Bible's one. What would the Holy Spirit? Can you sit and read the Bible and not... If you're truly concentrating on the Bible, can you sit and read the Bible and not have some kind of a... Um, different understanding or an enlightenment and connection, something. Can you read the Bible and not be changed? Maybe that's the best way to say it in some way. And then also, we've probably been in times, and I've, I've actually heard some, some people say this, been in times where you've been in a discussion with someone, and all of a sudden a Bible verse comes to your mind that like you weren't even thinking about it, but it's relevant to this conversation. What would we say that that is? That's the Spirit, right? Reminding us of the Word of God, which is what Christ said the Spirit would come to do. So, uh, so those two things would be the witness that we would speak of today. And if someone looks at the Bible and reads it and they don't have some change that goes on or a different line of thought that goes on, then they are probably have their heart hardened to the fact that they don't want to be different or they don't want to change in some way. 
All right, any questions down through question four? Question five then, what does Jesus mean when he says in verse 15, I judge no one? Okay. Does this mean that he never made a judgment? Is what, what did he actually call Peter at one point in time? Satan. Hey, he said, get behind me, Satan. Now, was he talking to Peter physically? Was he talking to the, the spirit that was within Peter? It's probably what he was talking to when he made that statement because he knew that, that Satan was trying to use Peter to keep him from going where he needed to go. What does he call the scribes and Pharisees? Starts with an H. <laughs> hypocrites, right? Call them hypocrites. Well, in order for him to say, Satan, get behind me when he's talking to Peter, in order for him to say, you hypocrites, what did he have to do? He had to make some type of a judgment call or an analysis of a decision that they had made. One of the two. Which then you get into, okay, is that any different than making a, a judgment? Because that's what a judge does, right? The judge is presented with evidence, and he says, this is my ruling. And, and he makes a judgment call somehow. Going back to what you said a while ago, too, he's, he is saying what God told him to say. Exactly right. Exactly right. Then the, the last half of that question is, what, what does John chapter 5, verses 26 and 27 tell us? Because this was also Jesus' words he himself. Judge, he said, you can't find it right now, something about you judge, you judge according to the flesh. Okay. <clears throat> and he said, he doesn't. Yeah, the, the literal words, at least in the ESV, someone's got King James tell me how that reads. The ESV says, I judge no one. Someone got King James Version? Yeah. What, is it, what does that verse say, uh, Don, verse 15? I judge no man. Okay. Um, which is, if you take the last half of that verse, if you chop it off, and you take the last half of that verse, could this be extremely misinterpreted? Because if you take the last half, then you're going to say, well, Christ didn't even judge anyone. And that's why you have to go back. We make the statement several times. I hope you've either written it down or committed it to memory. We interpret Scripture with what? Okay, you got to write it down because you hadn't committed to memory yet. <laughs> we interpret Scripture with what? With Scripture. We use Scripture to tell us what Scripture means. So go back to chapter 5, verse 26. Chapter 5, verse 26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. What does Jesus have the right to do? Judge. To judge. What did He come to this earth to do when He, at the time we're reading about? What was His role of coming to the earth? Seek and save. So he can save those who are lost, right? When he returns, second time, or I guess when he returns would be the first time, right? So when he returns in the future at some point, what's his role then? The judge. He had the authority to judge, but he wasn't executing the authority until the time was for him to execute that authority. So he come here to seek and save those who are lost. Now, so how do we then describe what he is doing when he says to Peter, get behind me Satan, and when he says to the, the scribes and Pharisees, uh, you hypocrites. Well, how do we fit that in with what we just talked about? Because if he came to seek and save those who are lost, 
But then he says, I have the authority to judge. How do we fit those two things in? And look at question six, and I think this will help us do that. He must, he must first convince of sin to lead them into the light, lead them to Him, lead them to repentance. Okay. And if He says nothing against sin, they're not convicted. Right. So He has to speak truth. And, and when He speaks truth, they're going to be faced with what? What do they have to do when they hear truth? They have to make what? They have to make a decision. Right? Okay, but isn't he also judging by his fruits? He's knowing them by their fruits, right. yeah. Right. Um, judgment. When he cleared the temple, when he said you give up these, too, he, cleared, he made a judgment there. He did. If he had a convinced convicted of sin and said that you know, wrong is wrong, you sin, sin. Why, well, it'd be like many today is saying, oh, it's just their lifestyle. Right. And you said he, he spoke to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know, yeah. You say the same thing about these hypocrites. Could, could. Because they were being influenced by Satan at that point in time. Or their hard-headedness, one of the two. <laughs> Um, question six, though, what's the difference in judgment and looking at the decision that is made? Did Jesus coming force people to make a decision? People make the decision. So God doesn't make that decision, they do. Which then gets into knowing them by their fruit, right? So had, had Peter made a decision when he stands in front of Christ and says, you do not need to go to Jerusalem. I paraphrase that, but had Peter made a decision? Would you call it a decision or just impulse? It's still a decision, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. Peter was being influenced. Um... He's being influenced, but he still has to make the decision, doesn't he? Right. Yeah. Unless he thought he was doing good by protecting Jesus. Right. He didn't realize the big picture. Had the scribes and Pharisees, when Christ called them hypocrites, had they made a decision? Not to believe. Not to believe, right? To question him, to deny him, to try and bring false accusations against him. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of the decisions they made, right? Today, do we make decisions? So when someone stands back and says, don't judge me, are we really judging them or are we just looking at the decisions that they've made? Someone decides to break in or someone decides to, to go down to uh, one of the local gas stations and they walk in and they, they rob the gas station. And we say, well, they're a thief. It depends we, on how you treat them and how you accept them in, in your life. And, uh, you know, if you say, well, he's a thief, I ain't messing with that guy. You know, yeah. If he, you know, we know he's a thief. I know people that don't come to church and they're not Christians, but I don't push them out. I try to bring them in. Okay. Yeah. There is a difference there, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So the individual that walks in the gas station and robs it, he's a thief because he made a decision, right? Not because I just said you're a thief. Now, if a guy never walked in and stole from the gas station, and, and to my knowledge never stole, and I said, well, you're a thief, what am I doing then? <laughs> I'm making some kind of a judgment that's not based on a decision that he made. When we look at individuals and their life, is defined by decisions they've made, and those decisions are sinful based upon what God's Word says. Are we judging them as a sinner, or did they make decisions? decisions. They made decisions, right? We're just looking at the results of the decision that they made. When someone takes a test, and we'll say there's 20 questions on it, and they answer those 20, 20 questions. Are they making a decision about each question? Okay, the, the result of those 
questions then comes up to a score, right? Am I judging them by giving them a 75? It's based upon the decisions that they made. Why is it so hard to differentiate between? Why is it that we claim, well, you're judging me, when in fact, most of the time, not all, because what um, Brother Willis brought up is true, but most of the time, we're looking at an individual and we're seeing the decisions they've made and we're saying, well, you know, we, you, you are a sinner. Why is it so hard for us to say? They think we're yeah. judging them and condemning them, but, and if it's taken the wrong way, like he's talking about, that could be true. Yeah. But really, we ought to be letting Jesus use us to be a light to say, look, look at this situation, the decision you made. We're shining a light on what is true. You know, this is not right. And letting them know, no, this is not right. So if it's done in the right way and through love, then it's not like we're judging or condemning them. We're just trying to reveal the truth to them. And so the guy that walks in and, and, and steals from the gas station, he is a thief. If we approach him and say, look, I know you stole from the gas station. I know you're a thief. But at the same time, I want you to know that I've sinned as well, and I've went against what God's Word tells me to do. But I want you to know what you've done is wrong. But I would really like for you to come to church with me. But you can, you can live your entire life in a community, be an upstanding citizen, and lost as a goose. Oh, absolutely. So, you know... And I'm going to take it a step further than that. You can walk in church every week and be that person you just defined. And you can walk in church all your life and you can still be lost as a goose. Right? And that's really, that's really not me. I'm not going to judge that situation on an individual basis because I'm not qualified in the first place. But who is? The Bible. The Word is. Jesus. The word is, and, and Jesus was given the authority. Uh, he also spoke what God told him to speak, which then brings conviction, which gets to the last part of that question six. Did we Jesus know where the problem starts at. It's when you stand and point that out. Because people are going to say you're judging them. And I will say that they have a leg to stand on if we are saying, we're right, you're wrong. Um, Most of the time you want to tell them they already know what they've done. You just got to show them where they've been in that direction. If we don't try to lead them to the right not way. Not necessarily because if they're not right with God, they just don't know they're wrong. They're yeah. Right. yeah. I figured that when I said that. I was like, no, that's yeah. not me. If we try to, if we try to, you know, just condemn them or, or judge them, if we don't try to correct them or show them the right way, then we're actually judging them. Right. Yeah. We're trying to sentence them to a place <laughs> instead of trying to bring them to a place. But it's not everybody you can walk up to and say that to, too, either. Like Chandra said, they're going to have to, I mean, they've got to have some kind of a conviction in order for you to even be able to talk to them. You can plant a seed Bible Bible teaches that all the sin comes short of the glory of God. And if you use that scripture and tell them things, say you're a sinner too then, right? You might want to preface it with I'm one first and then say you're you're one too. But but yeah. There's a you know So so looking at the end of question six, did Jesus coming force people to make a decision? So if Christ stands in front of you and says, I am the light of the world, what is he just forced? Not by physical force, but what is he just forced? You either have to say, yes, you are, or no, you're not. Right? He forced them to make that decision. Or I guess you could say they're middle of the road, but if they're middle of the road, they really are. They're really saying, no, you're not. Like they've not decided you are the light of the world. So when Christ comes in and He speaks, whatever He speaks, truth-wise, He's and maybe force is not the right word, but it is forcing a decision. You have to make a decision about what you, what they heard when they were standing there in front of them. Now, what has He left us with? Yes, 
what has he left physically with us, though? The Word of God, right? Which is, he spoke, but he spoke what God told him to spoke, so the Word of God. When he left us the Word of God, when we read the Word of God, what does it force us to have to do? Make a decision. Every Sunday morning in Sunday school, if you're in a Sunday school class, if, if Scripture is read, it's forcing you to make a decision. Do you agree with it or do you not? Every Sunday morning in worship service, as long as Scripture is being preached, it's forcing you to make a decision. Do you agree with it? Do you not? This last Sunday when we looked at, at some of those passages that people can become very um, defensive about, such as Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians passage. If you'll remember, I didn't say I want you to listen to what I say. I said I want you to read God's Word with me. Because it's not what I'm saying, and it's never, it should never be what we are saying. It should always be what Christ is saying, what God's Word is presenting. And when God's Word is presented, a decision has to be made. Now, sometimes that decision is to decide not to decide, which is a decision. That's right. That's right. I know people who throw the Bible from front to back are not Christians. No. Yeah, they've made a decision. They've made a decision. Yeah. So is the not a good one, but <laughs> not a good decision, but they made one. Is the statement that God will never force you to serve him? Is that a right or wrong statement? He'll never force you to serve him? Right. That's a correct statement. That's the reason that I say that when you said that he forces you, he doesn't force you. Well, he, he gives you the decision. Make, he forces you to make the decision. We still have to right. decide, okay. which means we have free will. But he doesn't force you to serve him. No, he doesn't force you to serve him. He forces a decision to be made. I either decide to serve him or I decide not to serve him. So, I mean, I can lay anything in front of you and say, what do you think about this? At that point, unless you say, I don't want to give you my opinion, then you're going to be making a decision. With God's Word, there is a decision that we make. And because it's placed in front of us, okay. it forces us to have that. to make I that. Was, I was confused on the fact that He forces you to serve Him, which He doesn't, because mm -hmm. He's not going to force anybody to serve Him. He can that use, has to be he a can free use will. lost people and save people to accomplish His will, though. Yeah, He is sovereign yeah. to where He can... Yeah. Yeah. But to serve him, no. Doesn't force. Otherwise, he would have never made Satan. I mean, he, why would he have. Right. Why would he let Satan rebel? Yeah. Unless you'd say that he, he gives free will, which we believe he does. All right, question seven then. What does verse 20 tell us about who was in control of all things? So look at verse 20 again. It says, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. You know, God himself is the one that's in control of all things. God decided for Christ to come into the world. But Christ did not decide when to go to the cross. God decided when he'd be going to the cross. Right. It was his plans. And when Christ comes back again, he don't know when he's coming. God makes that decision. Right. So you just answered the question. <laughs> um, God was in control of the timing. And, and the way we see that in verse 20 is it says, because his hour had not yet come, no one arrested him. In other words, no one could have arrested him at that point in time because his hour had not yet come. God was in control of that time, and uh, so it wasn't going to happen. I guess the, the global warming issue is the main time when I think, you know, people don't realize God's in control. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, now there is, you know, good stewardship that we can do right. um, concerning that, but ultimately God's in control. There's another time where I can't remember the situation where he was in a crowd or something he did or said, and then it says his hour was not yet come. Yes, so he disappeared in the crowd right. um, yeah. or went away without, without no one noticing or something like that. So verse 21 then, question 8, where was Jesus talking about that he was going and they could not come? So where was he talking about that he was going and they could not come? Heaven. He was talking about heaven or back to um, his father's side, if you want to say that. Why could they not come? As long as they stayed in the condition they were in, they, they couldn't believe. Say it again. They didn't believe in Christ. Yeah, because they did not believe in him, they couldn't come. Uh, it's interesting, <laughs> and, and you're right, because I know what you're meaning, but sometimes we say, as long as they remain a sinner, they can't come. You can change that condition. So, um, <coughs> do we sin after we become a believer? So we have to be careful with that terminology because someone could say, well, I'm still a sinner, but I believe in Christ and I believe He's the way and I'm trying to be different. Could still go to heaven, right? But then the flip side of that is a sinner that has not believed would not go. You see what I mean? The difference? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. So we were talking about preaching something on that last Sunday, and people are judging Christians, you know, and wonder, am I just okay? And everybody's watching everything we do and trying to find fault with us that aren't Christians, you know. And, uh, was talking about that and if we when we look at people and see that they're striving instead of judging then I think that's more important than because no matter what you do on this earth you're going to do something wrong you're going to make a mistake because you're human. right right and I mean look at Christ or Jesus he, they, the only place I can ever really find in the Bible you might know some more where he got angry was in the temple where he throws the money changers out and, mm -hmm. and I thought you know anger is something we're supposed to be able to control and everything and I thought about Jesus doing that but you know he was part human and so we have to look at the fact that we are human and look at what we're striving for and not judge us for what we do wrong. You know he got angry because God's house was being mistreated. Yeah. It was a righteous so anger uh, which is different than what we have sometimes. <laughs> um, now, sometimes we do have a righteous anger. When we get upset about someone that's, you know, maybe, I don't know what the example would be, but someone that is, um, well, let's go worst extreme, someone that's molesting a child. When we become angry about that, that's a righteous anger. That should never happen. But we have to be careful that we don't want to say, okay, that person needs to be put to death because that's not our place to do. So we have to say the action should have never happened. That's a sinful action. should not take place. And, uh, and our anger towards sin should be there, but not toward the individual necessarily. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yeah. If you see a person really striving in life, which we all are going to be doing, you know, until we get to heaven, we're going to be striving to be what God wants us to be. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to be looked at in that form instead of the judgmental attitude to get, you know, they're not Christians, and we're trying to be. Right, right. God had many instances of his anger throughout. He did. Through the blood. I mean, that's Go to, uh, that's righteous anger. I think it's in Malachi that the statement is made. I think that's Malachi. Don't, don't kill me if I have the wrong book, but I think it's in Malachi that it actually says God hates divorce. 
And of course that reference is because of the children of Israel that were constantly going away from him. They were committing adultery spiritually. And so he's making that statement that your marriage relationship is a picture of the relationship between an individual and God. And God doesn't want an adulterous relationship with his people. And so he makes a statement of he hates divorce because it's a it's that picture. Does that make sense? Uh, so he does have things that he that he does hate, you know. Um, look at uh, question eight, the very last part of that. Was it just at that time that they could not come? So they could come if they got saved, right? If they believed, right. yeah. So if they would change their belief, then they could. Now they couldn't at that time because it wasn't their time to go. But they would be able to go at some point in time if they believed. Verse, or question 9, was Jesus saying in verse 26 that there was much more he would like to say? If so, why didn't he say it? So verse 26 says, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. Is he saying that there's a whole lot more I'd like to say at this point in time? <laughs> that might have very well been his human side at that point. So why does he not say it? Not like God told him to. God sent yeah. him to do a thing, and he was doing what God sent him to do. Yeah, look at the end of verse 26. He says, what I have heard from him, I declare to the world what I have heard from him. In other words, I say what I've heard from him to say. There's a lot of stuff I'd like to tell you. And we probably have that thought about some individuals too. What we have to do is make sure that what we say is what God would want us to say. And that's what Christ was doing here. Question 10, from verse 29, what did Jesus always do? Was this a battle with his human nature? So verse 29, kind of the same thing we just talked about. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So what did he always do? What was pleasing to God, right? Was this a battle for him? No, it wasn't. I understand it. It wasn't his will, his nature as a human, as a man, to want to go suffer on the cross and die for mankind. But he gave in to the will of God. Right. He had two natures within him. And, and, uh, and we have... We have two natures as well after we become saved. It's not the same nature as Jesus Christ because we're not the Son of God. But we have a nature that is trying to follow Christ, and we have a nature then is, that is of the flesh. So both of those things battle against each other, right? Well, Christ was battling that as well. The difference is Christ never sinned. All those things were temptations for Him. Just like there's a lot that I'd like to say to you, but I only say what God wants me to say, Right? And then he says, and, and that gives us, that should kind of be, I don't know if reassuring is the right word, but it should give us a picture of like the battle we have in our mind, of there's things that we want to say but we don't. And sometimes we feel guilty about that. We have to realize that is a battle that goes on. It was a battle that went on, it appears, with Christ as well. And here he says, you know, I do, uh, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. It was a battle with his human nature. When he walked in the temple and they were doing what they were doing, they were cheating people out of money is one of the things, and they were misusing the temple because they were making money there, profits there, that wasn't going for the kingdom, it was going for their own gain. So when he walks in, his human nature probably was, and I want to go deal with these right now. If you remember... One of those instances, he actually took the time to braid a whip, which he didn't like. He didn't just pull something out of his pocket and go, "All right, I'm ready." I mean, it took time to braid the whip, right? We don't know how long it was, but we assume that it's probably a length of some kind. And he had to get the leathers from somewhere, so there was thought that went into this. This wasn't his immediate first reaction, human nature reaction. This was, uh, "I'm going to hear from God about what I need to do at this point in time. I'm going to braid this whip." I am going to use it, but, but I'm going to take some time to think through this. So we see that, that Christ did have this, this battle that went on, 
because he was fighting the human nature. If he was never tempted, then how could he suffer in all ways that we did? Because Scripture tells us he suffered in all ways that we did, which means he had to be tempted along the way. He just didn't give in to the temptation and sin. And then question 11, notice verse 30. Did Jesus speak when everyone was ready to hear? So verse 30, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So remember, he's speaking in front of a crowd. You've got the scribes and Pharisees that are against him, trying to arrest him kind of thing. But then you've also got other people there that are not just scribes and Pharisees. They're just common people in the Jewish nation, and they're there as well. Did he always speak when everyone was ready to hear him? There was a lot of people there that wasn't ready to hear that didn't believe him. Yeah. So why would he speak in this crowd where he knew there was people that were against him? Well, there was also people that was for him. Even they knew or would become, yeah. or would become for him, right? Maybe they weren't before he spoke, but after he spoke, they were, because it says, as he was saying these things. Many believed in him, which means prior to that, they weren't believing in him. After he speaks, they believe in him. Those that didn't believe him heard, so they had the opportunity. They were forced to make a decision. Right. The opportunity is given, but they, they were not jump on him. He couldn't believe it. I mean, he spoke for the benefit of those that would believe. Right. Like, you get up there and, and, and preach from the pulpit. You preach for the benefit of those that will believe. There'll be some sat there that won't. Yep. But you've got to preach to those that, wouldn't, that may believe, that will believe. Do we ever let those that will not believe silence us? Yes. We shouldn't, that's right. But do we? I don't know where you're going with that. There may come a time when I think at times happening some today when the churches are being silenced. Mm -hmm. And is it a silence, is it a lawfully they're being silenced, or is it a silence of I don't want to offend them, so I'm not going to speak? What about, because some people um, may have families that have family members within that are not saved. You're not judging them. They've made a choice and a decision. You just see the decision that they've made. And it's a worldly decision. And so when you come together at whatever times you get together, 4th of July, Christmas, Easter, whatever times it is, you come together, do you change your conversation because there's some there that are not believers? I hope not. No. Or believers of a different denomination. That gets them to it sometimes. Yeah, that, that's a, kind of a different, because if they're both believers, we're at least on that foundation. But we're talking about people that are not, not, believers. not believers. If you're a believer and they know it, they will change, should change their conversation. Should they? Yeah, because like with me, when my kids are around, they don't use bad language. <laughs> they watch it. Should they? <laughs> yes, they should. They know how I feel. They know my belief. So what you're saying is then that they should live a double life. Well, do you want me to live a double life? <laughs> how would you be living a double life? If I joined in on their conversation. Well, I'm not saying join in. I'm not saying that. Don't jump there. <laughs> so if they, if they live one way right. when they're not in front of you, and then they come to you and they live a different way, what are they doing? They're respecting me. And they're are they? Respecting my, yeah. Or are they living two different lives? It's in the name of respect, but they're living two different lives. So because they they're, they're presenting in front of you that they're one way, and then when they're in front of well, someone else, they're somewhere else. I know how they are. <laughs> <laughs> they know I know how, how they, they are. are. They know I know how they live and how huh? they talk or whatever. But when they're around me, they don't do that. You know, as a, as a minister, this happens all the time. 
So I can walk up to someone that's other people that are having conversation. I walk up, and you know what happens? The conversation changes. Should it? Yeah, I mean, even you, and it's not necessarily a minister, but if they know, same thing, this is what you're talking about. If you walk up, let's say they're among friends, and you walk up, their conversation may change, right? And we, and we say it's because they respect us. So why is it then? It's a given. So, so how are you supposed to handle because that situation? So I had a guy one time, uh, this was before we ever went into ministry, we, uh, uh, we would go to the lake, our kids were the same age, they were best friends, we would go to the lake with them, we stayed with them a few times, and they, um, they would actually drink, and, uh, and we didn't, and we told our kids we don't. And so the guy asked me one time, he said, so um, does it bother you if I drink in front of you? And I said, you know, it doesn't bother me. I said, but if it bothers you to drink in front of me, then it's wrong. So if it bothers them to talk the way they normally would talk in front of you, then it's wrong. And what they're doing is living a double life. And they may say it's out of respect, I'm doing this, but it doesn't make them any better. I'm not saying that. But I, so how am I supposed to handle the situation if they start using their language in front of me? If they start using their language in front of you, it gives you the opportunity to witness to them. Well, they know how but if they live a double know. life in front of you, then you don't have the opportunity. <laughs> but they already know. My kids was raised in church. They know right from wrong. Okay. So you're not going to win this thing with me. <laughs> you know, as a minister, I would much rather people just be who they are. But when it comes to preaching, when you're preaching, you should never give a thought of who's in that field and lost or saved. If you're preaching the gospel, preach the gospel. Preach the word. <clears throat> right down the line. Holy Spirit. Not, opinion, not an opinion, just the gospel. You said a key word, not an opinion. And too many times in the past we've preached opinions. And opinions are not what saves us. Just preach the truth. Yeah. But truth does. I would much rather someone live the life that they live, no matter where they are in front of me, than to live something different. It helps their witness to others, too. If you're, if you're living one way, just like she mm. says, if you're claiming to live one way and you do that and then you live another way outside of here that people close to you see, they're gonna, you're not going to win them over if they're not a Christian. You're not. Right. You're going to actually probably push them further away. And I see her side of it too. I do. The respect side. I, I was I arguing. I tolerate but... it in my house either. And I think that's why, I'm, I mean, I think that's why when people, even my kids that aren't Christians or whatever, they, they don't use that language necessarily in my house as much. I think... They use it around me. Yes, they do. You know. I think the thing we have to ask ourselves, and I'm not talking about you, I'm just talking about all of us here. The thing we have to ask ourselves is, are we asking them to change just because they're in front of me, or are we asking them to change because it's wrong? And if we're asking them to change just because they're in front of me, that's not the right reason to ask them to change. We need to ask them to change because it's wrong. So basically we should tell them you don't use that language here, but you don't use it anytime. Right, because otherwise we're te we're teaching them then to live a double life, and if we're not careful, we do that at church. Right? Think about some things that we may teach a double life at church. Here's a statement, and maybe every one of us have said it. We say something and we say, you know, I'm standing in church, I may get struck dead. Or I walked in, lying in my strike. Why? Why would it not happen outside the building? I agree. I mean, it, it, if we're not careful, we actually teach those same things. 
Because we sometimes will tell children, you can't act that way here at church. Uh, if you don't act that way at church, you can act that way at home. You can act that way at somebody else's house. Or we say, you know, should never wear that at church. Yeah, because what's, because what's actually in Christ's time before he dies on the cross, what was the most holy? Temple. The temple, right? The, the holy of holies, most holy place. Where did that place become after he died on the cross? Yeah, right here. Not here, but right here. Right? It's where the presence of God lives once we become saved. It's where the presence of God lives. Which means the same language that I use in here should be the same language I use anywhere else. If I'm not comfortable dressing, now I understand that there's like the you go to the beach, things are dead. I, I get that. But if we're going to go to another public place, restaurant, whatever we wear there, we should be comfortable with wearing here. Right? Whatever story that we're going to tell there, we should be comfortable telling here. And we should teach that as well. Because if not, we're teaching a double life. And maybe that's what's happened in some situations, is so we've like taught a, a double life. Your nay, let your nays be nay, a yay, and your nays be nay. That's right. So when you look at this, uh, I want to go back to question 11 again. Why did Jesus even speak to these who he knew were against him? And I think the, the way we have to think about that is there were some among that, that would make a decision, and we see that because it says many believed in him. We can't be silenced by those that are not going to agree with us because there may be someone out there that will believe. And I'm not talking about just from the pulpit. I'm talking about when you're among family, when you're among friends, conversation that you, should, that you would proclaim Christ in among believers is the same conversation you should proclaim Christ in among whoever you're around. It shouldn't change. Because there may be someone there that will believe, even though people are going to be against you. You walk into, I'm not saying, if I walk into the bar down here to buy ice, it's not a bar, liquor store to buy ice, right? <clears throat> same conversation that I have with you guys right now should be the same conversation that I would have there, right? The same action that I would have here should be the same action I should have there. Why is that so hard for us? Or is it? Does it become easier the longer that you live as a Christian? It does until politics become involved. And you think back to the last few elections, maybe not this past one, but the one before that. I want, to, um, I want to go back to something that Miss Leona said a minute ago. Really good comment, by the way. Um, sometimes there are people that become very critical of us as Christians um, because they look and they see things that we do wrong. And, um, and they use that sometimes as a, as a 
a reason to say, well, you're no better than what I am kind of thing, or, hey, you're wrong kind of thing. Should we be, should we get upset if someone points out the things that we have that are wrong in our life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That may be God's way of pointing out to us where we need to change. change. Sometimes other people see things that we don't. And sometimes, even though, like, it hurts, right? (laughs) Because we're trying to communicate truth to them and they're pointing back things at us. Maybe that means that we need to go back and get some things right in our life that we didn't even realize. Because if they bring it up, then we can, and we've been dealing with it, like it's been a conviction, we can quickly say, you know, God's been convicting me of that and I've been working on it. And yes, it is a problem in my life. I'm trying to work on it. But I just want you to know that there is truth. I'm trying to follow it. I'm not perfect with it. But sometimes what we do is we become upset that they have pointed things out to us And we shut down trying to talk to them because now we've been called on the carpet about something in our life. We get on the defensive. We get on the defensive. And reality is, if it if this is a if they bring up something that would help us be a better Christian, it doesn't matter who it is. We really should be now. I understand that we're not always going to walk up to them and shake their hand and say, Thank you for telling me that I'm a heathen. Right? We're not always going to do that. But at the same time, there should be a gratefulness that, okay, God's using them to point out something. Now, if it's a false accusation, that's something different, right? But if it's something real, then, then we have to somehow be thankful for that because it is maybe a message from God. And it goes back to what we brought up. Someone mentioned, I think Don maybe mentioned it, that God will use unbelievers and believers sometimes. Sometimes he speaks to an unbeliever, to a believer. Yeah. And if it don't bother you, they know. Well, she must, they must have something, you know. I don't have not to bother. Right. And so I, you know, that's a good point. Yeah. Because your faith, if it's strong enough, you're going to say, "Well, Lord, help me with whatever's wrong with me that I can't get through to." Yeah. You know? Right. Instead of your own self to do this, I think. Yeah. So, um, verse 29. Um, if you had to leave with something today, if you look at verse 29, it says, And he who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Could we say that verse 29 is true about us today? I'm going to break it down into three segments. First part, and he who sent me is with me. Could we say that if we're a believer today, that God has sent us in some way? Maybe it's to our spouse, maybe it's to our children, maybe it's to people we would teach in church, wherever it is. God sent us in some way. Could we say that? As a believer, would you all agree that God has sent you in some way? You don't know that it may be to one person, right? Can we all see that? Okay. He has not left me alone. Could we say that that's true? As a believer, could we say that's true about our life? So hopefully we're we're agreeing on the first two so far. And he who sent me is with me. He did send us. He didn't send us alone. You can go back to Abraham and you can see that, right? God called Abraham to leave the land of the Chaldeans. That's not right. Is that right? Wherever he left to go to the promised land. God called him to leave and go. God said, I want you to go, but I'm not going with you. That's not what he said. He said, I'll I'll be with you, right? So he sent us. He's with us. He's not left us alone. The last, the third part, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. Is that one always true in our life today? Do we begin...
God has had put there, and it had never rained, but yet he had the faith and the belief that God was in the center of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really something we tend to forget, you know, that God is in the center of everything we do, every decision we make. Should God be. Should be in the in the center of all those, yeah. So, do we ever begin our day saying, "Today, I'm going to do the things that please Him," or are we more apt to get up today and 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 we pray, maybe, and we read our Bible, but but then we get into and and maybe we say this, maybe we actually pray this. God, help me to make the right decision. Now, I know our, our intentions with that statement is absolutely good. Like, help me to make the right decision. What if we just said, though, God, help me to make the decision that is pleasing to you. Help me to make the choice that's pleasing to you. But you have to be careful because then life gets in the way. <laughs> like? Like something will come up that you didn't expect to come up and you... Don't want to do it? Get thrown, huh? And don't want to do it? No, it's not that. Oh. <laughs> you, you end up with the good intentions, but sometimes it just, and no matter how hard you try, it's kind of like having a flat tire on the way, way to work, right? <clears throat> Mary? Yeah. It's kind of like well, having a flat tire on the way to work. work on time, but. <laughs> Didn't she say when life gets in the way? You ain't never had life get in your way. Yep. Yes. So let me, here's what I struggle with, with life getting in the way. Isn't it really our decision gets in the way? There you go again. <laughs> Isn't it that, that we've decided to do something that's right? Now I understand a flat tire happens, but we can make a choice at that point. I'm going to glorify God through a flat tire, or I'm going to glorify Him through one that's aired up, yeah, and I get to work. There's, there's decisions that just make you mad. <laughs> no, I ain't and maybe for a minute or two you might forget what you prayed that morning <laughs> your humanness magnifies yeah your human part comes out on you there sometimes I'd like to record you Mary <laughs> I still but think that's that where with the good intentions. I mean, you but, can, but that's where God, help me to make the decision that's pleasing to you, which means my anger would not flare because my decision would be I'm going to handle whatever this is in the way that God would want it handled. I, I understand what, life gets in the way, but many times our decisions is what lets life get in the way. I don't get mad because I got flat. I just don't like it. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um. So if you leave with anything today, this third phase of this, well, actually all three phases of that verse I think are really important. God has sent us somewhere, and it may be for one person. But you know what? If, if we are the avenue that one person accepts Christ in some way, isn't our life well worth it? Yeah. James made a decision, and you know, of course, he had talked to you also to be safe. And when James was in the hospital at Dean, you and Joey helped me make that decision. Yeah. And if, if you two hadn't been there, I would not have made that decision that day. And in the same way with Ian, he, if Ian hadn't taken the time to talk to James that night, he would not have at that time. He may have later, I don't know. Right. And I may have later, I don't know. But it you're right, it takes that one person or sometimes two people. <laughs> and and we know during those times that Ian wasn't alone doing that. No. God was with him. Right? Even though everybody else had left the room. And I, I never will forget it. 
So um, he sent us. He's not left us alone. And our striving each day should be to do the things that are pleasing to him, even through the flat tires of life <laughs> or the things that become anger. <laughs> right, right. All right, let's pray, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this.